to have an opportunity um, to have more conversation with 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 Roger. Um, uh, Christine's already mentioned some of the things we have in common. I was uh, an admirer of Roger's work before I ever got to meet him. Um, and I was thrilled when he gave permission for one of his paintings, which I particularly love. It's a, it's a painting called The River of God, but it's, it's got a magnificent tree on it and a river. And it's got the... It does for me what happens also when I look at Samuel Palmer's paintings, that I see what I might expect to see, but I somehow see it bathed in Eden's light. There's a kind of transfiguration happening um, in to borrow, to borrow Herbert's phrase, a kind of heaven in ordinary. So I was thrilled when he gave me a permission to use that image on the cover of the first of my Poets' Corner collections. Um, but in fact, I had already grasped from Christine by then that Roger was writing poetry as well. So I thought, oh, well, this is a real chance to meet on grounds that I'm sure are of. And um, I was interested particularly that he has also, with some advantage as being a painter already, written, to borrow a beautiful word, ekphrastic poetry. Ekphrastic is one of those words, you know, you, you, you need to bring it out in casual dinner party conversation. Ekphrasis is, is mean, means to, to show out or speak out. And it's the term which is used for writing about visual art, writing about painting. Arguably the first great piece of ekphrastic writing is the description of the carvings on Achilles' shield in, in, in the Iliad. Uh, but there are famous more modern examples, uh, Ordens in the Musée des Beaux-Arts, for example. It, if a picture paints a thousand words, you've lost before you've even started. But nevertheless, you try. So I want to start, Roger, if I may. I'll kick off the ball to you. Is you've, you've written ekphrastic poetry as well as writing and making paintings that come from your own poems and poems from paintings. But you've done a piece on Fra Angelico where you don't have the advantage of having already made the painting. <laughs> and I guess in all of this, we're dealing with translation, aren't we? We're, we're, we're talk our topic is love in translation in a sense. We're trying to translate all kinds of inner loves into image or word. But in the Angelica, of course, this is your poetry about it. That's right. Well, this, I mean, many of you will recognize this is the staircase that leads up to the, uh, the dormitory in the monastery of, or the convent of San Marco in, in Florence. And I first went up that staircase when I was about 16 years old. And it's, it was a really... Uh, significant moment for me because I, I, I downstairs there's an extraordinary collection of for Angelico pictures um, and I was aware, I'd, I'd had a sort of Christian background but it had never meant that much to me but going I was aware of something in those images which I'd, I had never come across before uh, and then I went up the staircase and this was back in the 1970s um, where you could go in still to each of the cells and they had cushions on the floor. I mean, for me, there are two things that matter in galleries. The first is the paintings, but the other is the chairs. I'm, I, I rate galleries very much on, on how well you can sit down in front of a picture and just look at it. And my favourite gallery of all this is the, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, which has, I mean, stunning pictures, but also really comfortable <laughs> leather in front of chairs. Which are, but San Marco, you could do this in literally sit on the floor and just sit there for as long as you wanted and there are 44 cells which you could just go and, and do that in and I I have I don't think ever recovered from that experience because th these these images they're, they're kind of like windows sort of magic casements which lead you through into the the New Testament scenes uh, and this particular one is the the first thing you see um, which is the uh, the Annunciation. Um, the poem I'm going to read you is actually um, is not in, in in this book. It's a it's a very recent poem that I'm that is actually part of a book I'm I'm writing at the moment. About a couple of years ago, I, I wrote a book with a, a scientist, Andrew Briggs, called The Penultimate Curiosity, which is all about the relationship between art and science. And I'm now writing a book about the relationship between art and religion. And I'm structuring it using this the, the sections that. Frangelico used to paint this picture. He did it in, in 11 days uh, and sort of gradually worked down the, uh, the picture. And what's astonishing 
the framing device of this picture is not actually uh, anything from Christian imagery at all. It's a, it comes from, there had just arrived in, in Florence a manuscript of a Roman author, uh, architect Vitruvius, who had this great thing about how the circle and the square were uh, related to the human body. And so uh, circular and square buildings began to sort of appear in Florence all over the place. And what Francesco does here is to frame, use the sort of circle and square, use this, this pagan imagery to frame the story of the incarnation. Uh, so this is a poem uh, just about this top section. I hope, hopefully you have a handout. They may have got, if not, I hope a neighbour could... could Ah, uh, right. Oh, the, the handouts were sent many weeks ago. I don't know if there's any way of sharing some, but if not, you will get one before the before the session is over. So you'll have a record of them. You may just have to listen out if you haven't if you haven't got one. So, a circle here is written into stone through loggias where earth and heaven blend, eternity and time becoming one enfolding the beginning in the end. A rainbow forms a circle around the throne. Vitruvian man is standing in the sun, describing what the seers had been shown the days of the Messiah have begun. Here, center and circumference both mark where Logos is made flesh and air to sin. Yet, circling Mary's halo and the arch, a compass that is made from chalk and string, will scratch out on the plaster of a wall, a circle squared that will redeem us all. Thank you. Hey, that was, but you, Malcolm, are taking part in a exhibition in Oxford that's uh, going to happen in July, which yeah. is, you have done exactly the same, sort of written. Yeah, well this was, this was my discovery, how I learned the word ekphrastic was, I, I had, uh, there's a very uh, fine painter, um, both a portrait painter and a religious a Christian painter in the States called Bruce Herman, and uh, I once um, encountered a portrait he'd done of his father, and I found it so compelling. Uh, that I said to him I'd like to write a poet, poem about it, but I really needed to see the painting itself and, and not an image. And he said, oh, well, why don't you come to my studio um, in, in, in Gloucester, um, Massachusetts sometime, and you can just spend a little time there and do, do it. So uh, we agreed to do that, but of course he had a cunning plan, of which I knew nothing. When I got down to the studio, uh, it turned out that there were in fact not one, but 21 portraits of family and friends. And he explained to me, that he'd been struck by my finding the presence of his father in the painting so compelling, because in fact his father had died before he completed the painting, and he completed it as an act of you know vividly remembering love, and as a prayer about the final presence that we might have with one another in in Christ in heaven, and the result of that experience had been that he wanted to paint these other people he loved not the portraits of the rich the great and the good but of, of family and friends and he needed a poet to kind of draw out the theology which was about a theology of what it means to be face to face what it means to see through a glass darkly what it means as it were perhaps to perceive the kindling of the light that lightens everyone and that has made the world shining through human flesh uh, so i ended up uh, in this long project, which is now sort of traveling around a bit and, and it's going to be exhibited in Oxford, having been exhibited in America. And I want to share with you a painting, um, a poem about a self-portrait that the artist had made, uh, which it seemed to me drew out some of the things one wants to say, both about painting and poetry. So this is um, Bruce Herman's self-portrait, and um, I don't know if you're going to be able to, if you can see this in the, it's a very, very vivid piece of work when you, when you uh, see it in the flesh. He, he'd been commissioned to do some work, uh, uh, some frescoes in the Duomo in, in Orvieto, and um, the, the coloured tiles you sort of see in the background are actually from the du du Duomo there. Um, but what I, you may or may not see is that there's a very beautiful 
graceful sort of full female figure, a female nude, sort of arching behind him. I don't, you probably, it's, you, you have to look very closely and she sort of shimmers out of the, the, the brickwork. You can see the sort of curve there of, 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 of lift and thigh. Um, I don't know if we can have the lights off just for a second. Yeah. Um, and you can see just the sort of curve of breasts and a bit of the head up at the top and she's kind of arching behind him. And it took me a while to see that that was there and that she was behind him rather than in front of him. And there was something about the power of the artist to summon, but also to give the beauties their own time and space. Not, I mean, T.S. Eliot once said that poetry is peripheral vision, that you, you, this thing comes into your peripheral vision, and if you turn and stare too quickly, it's gone. You have to be very still and let it sort of emerge shyly. And it seemed to me he caught something of that process there. And also the slightly haunted look of the artist himself. One of the texts that we were working with together when we made this sequence of paintings and poems was C.S. Lewis's The Weight of Glory. And that sense of the hidden glory in all of us, the whole creation waiting to see it revealed. And our desire for a beauty that is not simply the spectator's beauty, but the mutual partaker's beauty. So I start this poem um, in response to this painting um, with a quotation from The Weight of Glory, which I then versify later on in the poem. I, not that Lewis needs versifying, he's a kind of prose poet anyway. So here's from The Weight of Glory. Ah, but we want so much more. Something the books on aesthetics take little notice of, but the poets and the mythologies know all about it. We do not want merely to see beauty, though God knows even that is bounty enough. We want something else which can hardly be put into words, to be united with that beauty, with the beauty we see, to, to pass into it, to receive it into ourselves, to bathe in it, to become part of it. So his portrait of the artist. There is a presence and an absence here. The artist sets himself aside, leaves space for his shy muse. Descending from her sphere, she shimmers through his touch and brush, which place these faint suggestions of her presence, where she arches just behind him, full of grace. He looks another way, as though aware that turning round to see would frighten her. He cannot see. We cannot help but stare, where light and shade, informing one another, call forth the forms that haunt his staring eyes, beauties from which not one of us recover. Beauties of gold and green appear and rise behind him like the walls of the Duomo, which hold the body and its mysteries. For he has summoned them like Prospero, spirits of air and fire, water, earth. They haunt him now and will not let him go until he paints for them the secret path whereby they might grow visible at last. Until he brings them to their proper birth. And in their presence we are found and lost. What finds us here is haunting, numinous, and opens out the secret of our past, that longing, inconsolable within us, for beauty, yes, and yet for something more. Not just to see the lovely, luminous appearances of nature, but to pour ourselves into and through them, to receive them into us, till beauty, grace, and power become the very world in which we live, the air we breathe, the light by which we see, and we are one with all the things we love. And what we lose is our complacency, the daily comfort of the commonplace, our cherished substitutes for grace and glory. These lines of longing in us somehow trace a portrait of the artist who has made us and waits for us to turn and see his face. 
Um, so that's going to be in St Giles, isn't it? That's, that painting will be in St Giles, and that particular poem is collected in my way after prayer um, collection. Uh, but you can see all those paintings. On, there's a website as well. Um, so painting, one source of inspiration. I guess the other one um, for both of us in very different ways is, uh, or perhaps in similar ways too, is uh, is George Herbert. Um, and um, yeah, we both uh, love the poet and the places associated with him. So um, I don't think we could meet without Herbert being quoted by one or the other of us. Yes, yeah. um, so I'm. Uh, this was another possibility for a cover. I think, um, because you've done. Do you want to talk about this painting a little bit? Yes. More well, in? this was this was a little painting actually done in um, George Herbert's garden, so that you can just see his the rectory of um, Bemerton uh, in in the background. Um, which is actually where Vikram Seth lives now. So I had a yeah. wonderful day there. I was sort of painting in his garden. He was writing in the novel. We met for lunch and then went off. Our, oh, so so it, was, it was absolutely amazing. Um, uh, but that's, yes, that's the sort of um, Herbert at the, um, uh, at the front of his collection of, um, uh, of poems there. And one of the things I've always actually really been, I guess you have too, been inspired with in, in that collection is that I'm mean, Apart from the poems themselves, there's just two poems in the middle of it where he starts, uh, which are both called Jordan. And it's not at all clear why they're called Jordan, because he doesn't explain it. They're not about the Jordan. They don't talk about baptism. They're actually about writing poetry. Um, and the, the second one in particular, where he, he talks about, how, you know, when first my lines of heavenly, heavenly love made mention, and... He, d he describes how he, when he started to try and write poetry, he made it really sort of complicated and yeah. use curling metaphors. And, and, uh, and there, but then right at the end, and he, he also talked about winding himself into the sense, which yeah, I think is yeah. a lovely... Yeah, it's fabulous, um, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's actually, it's very interesting sort of comparison with, with what we mean about love as well, because mm. somehow it's very easy to do that in... You think you love someone, but actually you may be just in love with your idea of love, or love with being a good person, or, or or something. But but actually, to get to the core of sort of stepping into someone else's experience, which is what Herbert does with his experience of God, and he he ends up um, by he talks about himself as bustling around, and then has this wonderful. There's always a friend in in Herbert's poem who suddenly speaks to him, and he okay. he says. Uh, um, how wide and long is all this? Uh, how wide is all this long expense? There is in love a sweetness ready penned. Yeah. Copy out that only, and save expense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's often he yeah, but often poses the really complicated problem, because we are complex people, and then the friend or Christ Himself comes in. With an answer, I love the one, the quip where you know the merry world did on a day with his trained bands and mates agree, and or, you know all in sport to jest at me. And the, the the last line is one piece of cynical mockery after another is offered at George Herbert, and the end line of each verse is, "But thou shalt answer, Lord, for me." You know, <laughs> I'm just going to let you take care of this one. Yes. So. Um, Again, you've got a, a piece of, as well as the painting, you've got a piece of poetry that, that, that comes out of um, this engagement with, with Herbert in one way or another. Yes, well, I, it's that that sense of the... I mean, he, as I was saying, he calls the poems Jordan, but you don't know why, but you have... He leaves us to guess that. And my sort of guess is it's something to do with 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 baptism and baptizing his imagination, sort of stepping into the waters of imagination, something like that. Uh, and so the the poem that um, that is not a particularly like Herbert or anything, but it's it it has this sense of what uh, of love of, of stepping out into something beyond ourselves. It's actually it's one of the poems that I include in here, but I actually wrote it um, about sort of thirty years ago. Um, uh, and then I sort of stopped writing poetry for, for, for a very long time. But I went on to painting the images that were connected with that, that poem. So I'll show you some of the, um, of the images. Um, this is the first image that, um, that I did when I was um, writing the poem. And uh, as, I, as I read it, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some, some more. So it's called Walking on Water. And it just begins with the, the quotation from, from Matthew, Lord... 
If it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. To step out of ourselves onto that sea, forsaking all the safeties that we know, becoming for one moment wholly free that in that moment endless love might grow. To step into a love which calls us out from all evasions of one central choice, besieged by winds of fear and waves of doubt, yet summoned by that everlasting voice. To walk on water in astonished joy towards those outstretched arms which draw us near, then caught by winds which threaten to destroy, we sink into the waters of our fear. Yet, underneath all fears and false alarms, our sinking held by everlasting arms. Yeah, that's beautiful. Interestingly, that great passage about underneath of the everlasting arms, the underneathness of that, when I came to write a poem in my sequence responding to Herbert's poem, Prayer, uh, I, I ended the, the poem on the phrase, the Christian plummet. <laughs> Yes. And that sense of the plummeting down, I ended with the phrase, um, underneath are the everlasting arms. Yeah. Um, I do think that's something you get in Herbert a lot, that he's not simply a, about the heights. You know, it's very easy. The, the natural, the sort of default setting of the human religious imagination is to have God up there. And that's why... Um, Christianity is such a radical rethinking of everything forced by the events of the Incarnation because God comes down. I remember I once wrote a poem called um, Descent, which sadly I, 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 I would like to resist the tyranny of orthography and standardised spelling. I think it was a disaster in the 18th century when they standardised spelling because you could spell anything any way you wanted and mean everything by it. So when I wrote this poem called Descent, I wanted people to hear both descent, descending down, the descent of God, the, the, the kenosis. But I also wanted to hear descent, I beg to differ. And with that poem I began, I said, we began, um, uh, it's not in the anthology, um, they sought to soar into the skies, those classic gods of high renown. For lofty pride aspires to rise, but you came down. You dropped down from the mountains sheer forsook the eagle for the dove. The other gods demanded fear, but you gave love. Where chiseled marble seemed to freeze their abstract and perfected form, compassion brought you to your knees. Your blood was warm. They called for blood in sacrifice and victims on their altars bled. When no one else could pay the price, you died instead. They towered above this mortal plane, dismissed this restless flesh with scorn, aloof from birth and death and pain. But you were born, born to these burdens, born by all, born with us all, astride the grave, weak to be with us when we fall, but strong to save. And... Again, I'm not sure I could have written that poem without Herbert. Not, in fact, the meter of that poem, which is called English Suffix, where you have um, three lines of tetrameter, so three lines with four iams, ba-dum, 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 ba-dum. And then the final line, but you came down, or but you were born, is just four stresses with no unstressed words. And it is a kind of diminuendo in the, in the meter itself, which Herbert uses on a number of poems. Um, Virtue is one of them. So I borrowed Herbert's meter, but in a sense, I couldn't have done the whole thing without this absolutely sure touch of Herbert, that he can take you up to gladness of the best and exalted manner. But he's no sooner written the word exalted manner in his poem prayer than he writes the words heaven in ordinary. You know, it's that both andness. Um, like in his, his poem, Bittersweet, um, you know, all my sour sweet days I will lament and love. So I don't know if we can just go back to the image of Herbert, but isn't, mm. I, I just thought for this, I, I didn't mean to quote those, those are just random poems I quoted, but I would like to read just 
to conclude what we had to say about Herbert, my own poem about Herbert himself, which is a kind of thank you note to Herbert. Um, and it's just called George Herbert. Gentle exemplar, help us in our trials with all that passed between you and your Lord, that intimate exchange of frowns and smiles which chronicled your love match with the word. Your manuscript, entrusted to a friend, has been entrusted now to every soul. We make a new beginning in your end and find your broken heart has made us whole. Time has transplanted you, and you take root past changing in the paradise of love. Help me to trace your temple, tune your lute, and listen for an echo from above. Open the window, let me hear you sing, and see the word with you in everything. I haven't told you, but because Malcolm's latest book is is about that wonderful poem, Prayer, which just has one image after another, and um, it's a great sort of pile of, of things. And the, um, when I was painting that little picture, Vikram sort of showed me the, the room where they think um, uh, Herbert sort of wrote these, yes, things, yes, which, yes, is, which is full of junk where he's yeah, yeah. It, and it just sort of so, reminded yeah. me of that poem, sort of where he's sort of thrown everything together. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean. Yes, in, in my poem about heaven in ordinary, I talk about God, God's light shining through amidst the clutter of the everyday. Yeah. And in fact, I too have stood in that yeah, room, true. music room, and it was in fact full of junk. It was great. Actually, it was great. Oh, sorry, this is where we where we embarrass Vikram Seth. You know, it's actually much nicer to be in a house that, but it's also got a you know what Ben John Ben Johnson called his commonplace book, the lumber room. And, you know, because the way he took out the material for making new things with. So it's a bit it's a bit like that as well. I think it's lovely that it's still a writer's house and not a museum. Well, let's go on to our next writer. Um, oh, actually, I should have shown you that. That was the, um, yes, that's the, that's the house and that's the little church. Um, yeah. Um, uh, which is, <laughs> which is wonderful. Um, and this is Coleridge's gravestone. Yeah. Um, which is actually, I mean, well, you've, written a whole book about Coleridge, Coleridge yeah. um, and um, which is particularly about the, the imagination uh, and, yeah. and uh, the ancient mariner, but the, but the imagination is actually so yeah, yeah, central. Yeah, it is absolutely. I mean, in fact, the way I came to write that book, um, it's actually 10 years ago, it's the 10th anniversary this year, I published a, my first sort of foolish academic book, which was called Faith, Hope and Poetry and subtitled Theology and the Poetic Imagination. And essentially, it's a defense of the imagination as a truth-bearing faculty. But I do it by giving a reading, a sort of spiritually open reading of moments of classic English poetry from The Dream of the Root to, to Seamus Heaney. Um, that is to say, poetry in English. I would never dare to call Heaney English in any other way. But um, uh, I was just, I felt that the contemporary secular academic establishment was willfully misreading some of these poems or not seeing those other dimensions. So I did that. Um, but I realized, A, that I had quoted Coleridge in every single chapter, and B, that the chapter on Coleridge was the central chapter of that book. And that, in fact, it was a bit silly for, you know, Malcolm to think he was going to defend the imagination because it, it had had a much abler defender uh, uh, in the 19th century, but uh, perhaps that defense had been overlooked. So Coleridge, I mean, Coleridge, uh, I mean, two things um, that one might want to say about Coleridge and imagination. Uh, I think the first thing is to say that he famously says that the, the primary imagination, as he calls it, is the living power and prime agent of all perception. So all perception, not just your being literary and creative, but to see the world at all, to distinguish from the mass of material just flowing towards your eyes, a face, and to understand the soul through the eyes in the face. These are all active shaping powers of perception. You know, we're not just computers recording stuff. We're not, you know, the, the, there is a difference between, you know, uh, um, uh, some sort of, uh, you know, sonic device recording the, the tempos and ups and downs of a Mozart and a sensitive soul listening to the concert, you know. We're shaping and perceiving. 
Now, some people would say that if we imaginatively shape and perceive, we can't really be sure what's out there at all. But Coleridge felt that our power imaginatively to shape and perceive was actually given by the one who is imaginatively shaping and creating the universe. That the logos, the one through whom things and in whom things are made, the eternal logos, and the light which lightens everyone that comes into the world, the logos in here, were, as it were, meeting each other in every moment of perception. So having said it's the living power and prime agent of all perception, Coleridge then goes on to say that it is the imagination, this is his definition of it, is a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. Amazing idea. That, and of course, eternal act, the word eternal doesn't fall lightly from Coleridge's lips because he knows his Greek. So he's not saying going on forever and ever. He means beyond time. He means to the eternal, every moment in time is equally near and present. The world is still, in a sense, being created as it is perceived. So the final and easiest metaphor that Coleridge came up with, he said, is it's a bit like a poem or a painting. You could do an analysis, if, you know, the sheets you've been given with our poems on them. You could do a complete and uh, extremely interesting chemical analysis of the composition of the paper. You could do a fabulous statistical analysis of the frequency of repeated shapes among the letters. You could also do some quite cool geometry on them as well. And you could amass a huge bank of entirely full and correct information and never at any point grasp that it was a poem. You would be lead, losing your analytic reason. And when eventually someone said, hey, why not look at it this way, and read it to you, you would be astonished and, I hope, pleased. But it wouldn't undo any of those interesting facts. And all those interesting facts are not only interesting but important, because without them you wouldn't have the poem. So Coleridge began to see that the development of science, uh, which he was very keen on, was very good at analysing the paper and the, the geom geometric shapes, but had forgotten it was language. And that the only the living power of a baptised imagination could begin to hear what the language was saying. So he got to this in poetry before he got there in prose. And f very early on in the famous poem, Frost at Midnight, where he's imagining how his young son, uh, Hartney, might grow up um, and, and amidst the, the lake by thou my child shall wander like a breeze by lakes and sandy shores beneath the crags of ancient, ancient mountains and then you remember this is what he says addressing the sun as he thinks of him growing up so shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters who doth teach himself in all, and all things in himself. Great universal teacher, he shall mould thy spirit, and by giving, make it ask. Fabulous, fabulous account of teaching, giving. So that, that notion that we must wake up to what's being said to us and understand translate it, let God yes, translate yes. it for us. And I mean, the extraordinary thing about, as you say, I mean, he, that's really early, I mean, and that I think it's, it's, for me, Frost and Midnight is one of the most sort of beautiful poems in the English language. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, sort of perfect. But that that notion of, of actually nature being God's sort of language yeah. to us is, is obviously, I mean, he, uh, he develops that, and, uh, uh, but it comes right out of the Psalms, around Psalm 19, well, which is again... Heavens declare the glory of the Lord, Lord and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. Uh, but then that goes on. There are no words, there is no language, yeah. and yet... So you, he, night unto night. Which yeah. is... You can see it both ways, and you can be completely blind to that. You can not hear the language, not hear the words, but suddenly yeah. you can see it, which is, again, in the ancient mariner, exactly, exactly what so, happened yeah. with the, the water. And, and I, I, I want to just say at this point, as a you know, quick theological... Oh, good, there's more copies. Of this. You will all get one in the end now. So, so um, some people, you know, the sort of handy Noddy's Guide to English Literature written by the theologically uninformed... Um, uh, all tell you that Wordsworth and Coleridge, as though they were the same person with two heads, that Wordsworth and Coleridge were pantheists. Well, the jury may be out on Wordsworth, but under no circumstances was Coleridge a pantheist. A pantheist is somebody who says everything is God. If Coleridge says that eternal language 
whereby he teaches all things in himself, uh, himself in all things, all things in himself. Yeah, that, t- that phrase might sound pantheist, but it is God beyond the language of creation uttering something to you through the creation. And that therefore distinguishes the transcendence. And in fact, really within two or three years of having written that poem, Coleridge had effectively returned to a position of intellectually getting the Trinity. And then about four or five years later had a radical reconversion where he he not only got the Trinity, but he realized that the second person of the Trinity was not only a great idea called the Logos, but was actually the only one who could come in and change his life for the better and, and re, reorder his heart. So just I just want to rescue Coleridge from accusations of heresy. <laughs> Should we have some poems? <laughs> <laughs> so um, you've got a, a poem about the seraphim who play an important part in um, The End of the Mariner uh, because it turns out that the the apparently ghastly crew, the sort of zombie crew that have accompanied him back to the land and redemption are in fact um, seraphs. And at the very end he sees them in their true form. That's a very interesting idea in itself, that even the most apparently odious and difficult situations and situations of illness and the fear of infection and all of that might still bring us heavenly messages if we were prepared to listen. Um, so uh, I've got a poem on Coleridge, and I think you've got a poem on the seraphim. So, what should we do for yours? Uh, okay, yours shall I do first? Either? So th- this is a poem on the on the seraphim, but actually, um, it's seraphim aren't mentioned. It's a, one of a sequence of three poems, and this is the last one, uh, which starts with uh, a quotation from Psalm 104, which I think is just one of the most extraordinary. It says he he makes winds his angels. Um, or his Malachi, his, his, uh, his messengers, um, his servants, flames of fire, um, which is very much a sort of <laughs> the, the idea that Coleridge takes over, that actually um, that these things, yes, you can just see them as winds, you can just see them as flames, but they can be messengers of the Almighty. <coughs> Who hears the ocean roaring in a tree, Move on to pictures. So I'll show you some of the sequence of um, of the pictures that uh, that relate to these this sequence of poems. Who hears the ocean roaring in a tree that rustles like a thousand angels' wings, and feels the rising wind he cannot see, is seeing to the burning heart of things, for as a book has pages stamped with ink, while yet some meaning rustles all its leaves. So all things are as words that forge a link between the writer and the one who reads. And that unnamed I am that forged all things whose presence is the ocean in a tree that rustles like a thousand angels' wings, stirred by a wind no human eye can see, breathes hope into the ash where hopes expire, in winds that flame with Pentecostal fire. Oh, that's fabulous. I, I love that. That painting of the angels reaping, is the first painting of yours that I ever saw. I didn't see it in the flesh, but I saw an image of it. And I was just immediately attracted to it. I thought, oh, uh, this is somebody who sees the world the same way I do. But, um, yeah, I love I love that poem. And I noticed you use the big capital I am, yes. which is a huge thing for Coleridge. Imagination, the repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. The discovery or rediscovery, he should have known this because he, he was the son of a vicar at Coleridge, you know. But, so that's why you have to give him time and lots of leeway. You, know, you, have, to, you have to get some blue water, stormy blue water, yeah, before between yourself and the vicarage before you can come back to faith. But um, when he realised that the name that God discloses to Moses, Yahweh, is I Am, he had, in his struggles with the kind of reductive nature of contemporary philosophy, he'd made a note in, in the margin of his copy of Spinoza 
um, where he basically said there are only two starting points for thought. You either have to start with it is and just the plain uninflected world of things being themselves and no more and see if from this collection of dust floating in an empty space you can come up with anything that sounds like I am. And he says you're never going to do that. Or you can think that I am is the prime statement and then figure out if there's anything out there for the I am to see. And he says you're more likely to arrive at something if you start with I am. But he said that before he realised that that's exactly what the Bible does. <laughs> it's, you know, it's kind of, yeah, I am. Wait a minute. So I don't know if we can quickly flip back to the, to the I'm sorry, I did these poems in the wrong order, um, uh, to the, the epic, 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 uh, epitaph. So I love this. I, I venerate this place and this stone. Um, he, he composed this as his own, as his own um, epitaph for his gravestone. It's a wonderfully... Um, Emphatic, not to say imperative beginning, is it not? Stop, Christian passerby. Stop, child of God. And read with gentle breast beneath this sod a poet lies or that which once seemed he. A lift a thought in prayer for STC. And I always think it's, it, it's exactly like the ancient mariner, you know. It is an ancient mariner. He stoppeth one in three by thy long grey beard and glittering eye. Now wherefore stops thou me? You know, that poem opens with the narrator of the poem is embarrassing street person where you're out with your mates you know you're on your way to a jolly wedding you know and this random ragged guy you know with a wild beard points his skinny and say look look i've already bought the big issue give me a break you know and, and he gets hold of you but actually i felt and i thought wouldn't you know the guy dies and he's still doing it he's still going you know stop but he stopped me in my tracks as a as a poet he stopped me as a, as a person and he was a very important part of my own journey to Christianity. So when I wrote this poem, um, Coleridge, I started my, my tribute to Coleridge with, with, um, with the opening line of his epitaph. Stop, Christian passerby. Stop, child of God. You made your epitaph imperative and stopped this wedding guest. But I am glad to stop with you and start again, to live from that pure source the all-renewing stream whose living power is imagination and know myself a child of the I am, open and loving to his whole creation. Your glittering eye taught mine to pierce the veil and let his light transfigure all my seeing to serve the shaping spirit whom I feel and make with him the poem of my being. I follow where you sail towards our haven, your wide wake lit with glimmerings of heaven. Mm, that's lovely. So, uh, so we're going to have to move rather quickly. We have to move <laughs> swiftly on. And the, the one poet and indeed painter who is a huge inspiration to both of us and on whom we haven't touched yet and for whom we have a lot of time is, is of course, William Blake. Uh, and there's been a fabulous exhibition um, at the... Uh, at, I say fabulous for the content. I wasn't so enchanted with the arrangement, but... Uh, yes, yes, no, all the, um, the catalogue. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, actually, I love... This is the... I'll just put up this because I, I just came across this the other day and it's so wonderful. This is the, the, the actual context for um, the, the poem Jerusalem. Uh, and it starts with this preface, which I just... Um, I'll, it just says, painters architects, sculptors, this is right at the bottom, um, do not let your spirits be depressed by the, uh, the prices that are given for worthless works of art <laughs> or the advertisements that are, <laughs> that are spent on them. <laughs> um, but it goes on to talk about um, be true to your own imagination uh, and that we should live in the worlds of eternity in which we shall live forever in Jesus our Lord. Absolutely. And should those feet in ancient yeah, times. Exactly. And, and then it goes on to that poem and then ends, you can see, would to God that all, all the Lord's, Lord's people, people were be prophets. prophets. And yeah. that's, that's what he's getting at. Yeah. Um, which is, I in fact, they, they, he speaks constantly of Jesus the imagination. And the moment of repentance in, in the great long prophetic poem, Jerusalem, not the little lyric, where Albion finally comes to himself, and this is prophecy, I think it is yet to come that Albion, you know, uh, these ancient places should, when Albion comes to himself and repents, he comes to the crucified Jesus and he says, oh, 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 
human love or oh, divine imagination. That's it, in imagination. I turned aside from thee into the wastes of the moral law. But now I repent. You know, and it's about coming back to Jesus as the one we meet through the imagination. Now, I was astonished when I read that, that Blake's association of Jesus with the redemptive and revivifying powers of the imagination. Because, of course, Coleridge had come to the conclusion that the Logos in us was indeed the divine imagination and that, that the image of God in us was imagination. So I imagined, you know, what an extraordinary conversation they could have had. And then I discovered when I was working on my Coleridge book that, in fact, they'd met. Uh, but uh, possibly on more than one occasion, but there was one occasion. And um, they were introduced by a Swedenborgian called uh, Augustus Tulk. And unfortunately, like so many people who were hung around when Coleridge was discoursing, they, they always say, it was wonderful, and then they never tell you what he said. So he said, when Blake and Coleridge were together, I felt that two divine beings, two, as it were, angels of the spheres, were treading for a moment upon our planet, you know, and I was lifted up into the sublime. But it doesn't tell you what they said. So I once put together as a sort of little play thing, I did it for the Blake Society, an imaginary conversation about imagination between Coleridge and Blake. Oh, and it uh, all with everything quoted from their works and letters. And it was amazing how they yes, dovetailed. Yes, yes. I should say that um, just on that thing about expensive um, pictures, <laughs> that I have actually got an exhibition here in the, in the, in the <laughs> chapel, <laughs> which is as, as cheap as chips. It's not yeah, expensive yeah, yeah. at all. So do, do go and look at that. <laughs> so we've got, we better do our poems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to do things, which I suppose have touched on Blake in one way or another. The other thing I should say about Blake is that happily he was rediscovered when he was an old man, you know, living in Fountain Court by a young and ardent group of, of painters who wanted a clarified vision and a baptised imagination who called themselves the Ancients, which of course included Linnell and Samuel Palmer. And Linnell commissioned Blake to do, I think, the great masterpiece of his life, which is the illustrations for the Dante, for the Divine Comedy. Now, I should actually say, Linnell's, um, one of Linnell's um, uh, descendants has just commissioned me to do uh, an angel for a church in London, which I'm using a, a Blake image yeah. for, so, which is just a wonderful <laughs> fun thing. So, right, uh, no, so is, is it me? <laughs> um, yeah, well, let me, let me then, um, I'm going to read you a, a, a poem called Dancing Through the Fire, which is a response to a great moment in Dante, which is illustrated by uh, Blake and also um, uh, Botticelli before him and, and alluded to by, by Eliot. It's the moment when um, they get to the very top of Mount Purgatory. Mount Purgatory, they're being gradually purged of the seven deadly sins. They start with the really difficult one at the bottom, which is pride, and they work their way up. But you have to get through all seven, unfortunately. You can't leave any off the menu. And um, so, of course, the last and least, but still tricky, is lust. And uh, that is figured as a circle of fire. But it's fire. It's the fire that was set at Eden to keep us out. It's, it's about returning to the primal garden of our delights and our tendernesses. You need to get the ordering of your love right for that. And he can only even dare to go into the fire because Beatrice is waiting on the other side. But it's a curious fact. You know, they're in company, Dante meets, that the closer they get to dealing with this lust issue, the more poets there are. By the time they finally get there, it's like Stacey Asano. It's like practically a conger of poets. I, I just remark on that as a curious thing. I, I couldn't possibly comment. But uh, anyway, so this was my... Uh, and, of course, Eliot alludes to that in Little Gidding where the figure tells him that he must be restored by that refining fire where you must move in measure like a dancer. So here's my dancing through the fire. Then stir my love in idleness to flame, to find at last the free refining fire that guards the hidden garden whence I came. Oh, do not kill, but quicken my desire. Better to spare me on than leave me cold. Not maimed, I come to you. I come entire, lit by the loves that warm, the lusts that scold. That you may prove the one, reprove the other, though both have been the strength by which I scaled the steps so far to come where poets gather and sing such songs as love gives them to sing. I thank God for the ones who brought me hither and taught me by example how to bring the slow growth of a poet
the tautness of each line, taught me to taste the grace of transformation and trace in dust the face of the divine. Taught me the truth as poet and as Christian that drawing water turns it into wine. Now I am drawn through their imagination to dare to dance with them into the fire harder than any grand renunciation to bring to Christ the heart of my desire just as it is in every imperfection surrendered to his bright refiner's fire that love might have its death and resurrection well um, I think my most Blakeian poem is again the poem that I wrote about 30 years ago um, which is again included in here, but I've slightly changed it. Um, and it was written, I'd been living in Oxford for some time, um, and I, I'd been brought up in London, but I, I, I hadn't been there. And I went, I went back to London on the bus and, and sort of got out in, in Oxford Street and was uh, really shocked and surprised at what I found there. That it was, uh, I went into a phone call, a phone booth, and they were all sort of filled with sort of sex workers, things which I'd never seen before when I was growing up. Uh, and then I went down to the, the Thames, and all these sort of street sleepers were there, which was, again, uh, something I, I hadn't been aware of as a, as a child. Um, and so I started to write a, a poem about this, which is, I suppose, has echoes of, of Blake's um, poem, sort of London, when, when oh, he, yes, sir, um, he, he sort of talks about you know, what... Um, the London that was surrounding him in, in the um, late 18th century. So this is called The Mirrors, uh, and it has, again, an epigraph from, from Genesis. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female created he them. The mirrors of Almighty God have blankets made of plastic bags, Beneath the bridge at Charing Cross, near where the river's current drags its burden of black stinking mud and rubber tires and broken oars, they lie like Lazarus at night when rich men's guard dogs licked his sores. The mirrors of Almighty God have Oxford Street as their love bar. They leave their names in public phones and sell themselves for half an hour, or find their work in adult shows that line the streets of Soho Square, performing like King Herod's niece for those who buy their right to stare. The mirrors of Almighty God, more deeply than all skill could mend, in love's first garden, looked on death, and looking cracked from end to end. But if a face could crack a glass, the reflex of that would be true, that in the beauty of a face, a broken mirror is made new. So one who came from Simon's house found that her face was wet with tears, but shining just as Moses did when love had washed away his fears. And once, among the Gadarenes, the naked man they came to find sat looking into God's own face, clothed, healed, and in his right mind. Oh, thank you, that's really beautiful. It's just good to end on that notion of face-to-faceness because I think that's what painting is ultimately about, but hopefully poetry too is that removing of the...